Province essentially was on land that was taken from the Khoisan and granted to Freeburgers without the Khoisan's permission, but by decree by the VOC. People who are sitting in Amsterdam, you know, that doesn't even know what the Cape looked like. This is the Lisbeck River, along which those first farms were. Jan van Riebeek built a fence from the mouth of the river all the way to Kirstenbosch, blocking the Khoi Khoi from the river and protecting their settlements. That fence essentially became South Africa's first boundary, separating black and white, almost symbolizing apartheid. In his diary, Jan van Riebeck wrote, and everything will be well protected against raids by the Hottentots. The Khorinaikwa, when they arrived back here, I mean, to, to find their grazing lands being fenced off, this must have been a huge blow to the Khoisan, to see this happening, you know, by these, these visitors, these people that they thought were not going to be here forever. This resulted in what we know today as the first Khoi Dutch War of 1659-1660. It was in fact the first war of resistance in this country. It has to be seen in that context. The Khoi Khoi were not naive to think that they could overthrow the Dutch. Remember the Dutch had muskets, they had guns, they had cannon. The Khoi Khoi had fire and sticks, they had bows and arrows, they had spears, and I mean, the depiction of Doman with a spear in his hand was essentially his image as the first guerrilla fighter in this country. People's concept of war is different, right? But in the, in the, in the context of this particular war, it was more a series of guerrilla attacks on the Dutch. In 1672, the Dutch tricked two Khoi Khoi leaders who had no authority into signing away the whole Cape all the way to Saldana and the Hottentots Holland to the east. This is a photograph of the original document. It's stated specifically the land bought by the Dutch in 1672 included the Cape Peninsula, Hottentots, Holland, Falls Bay, and Saldana. And the Dutch tried to prove by that document this land belonged to white colonists under the rule of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC. Obviously, we cannot accept that. It was nothing else but the old co-option tokenism that took place there. And what's more, in terms of your intention, which the law requires you to, 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 to have a full understanding of what you are signing, they could not have had the same understanding of the legal philosophy of the Dutch. The Khoi people had a completely different concept of ownership. They believed that in the first instance, God created land. And it totally clashed with the colonizers, the Europeans' worldview regarding land. And because it's, it's a divine gift, it was not up to the chief or the community to give it away. So all the treaties that have been signed during the colonial eras, both in the Dutch colonial era and the, the later English colonials, was, uh, were actually null and void. One of Jan van Riebeck's trusted interpreters was a young woman, Kratoa, or Eva, as he called her. She was Ochimau's niece, and as far as we know, the first indigenous woman to marry a European. At the age of 10, 11, she is recruited from the community by 
Jan van Riebeek's wife. It clearly states in Van Riebeek's diary that she came into the service of my wife. And then secondly, the kind of clothes that she wore were not European clothes. They were clothes associated with East Asian slaves. So she was a servant. By the time she's sort of 15, 16, she's being used for interpretation, um, for diplomacy work. Kritoa was using her position for the benefit of her people at times, and not just for herself, and not just for Van Riebeek. After her husband died during an expedition, Kratoa became an outcast amongst her own people, who believed that she had sold them out. And without her husband, and the support of Van Riebeek, who had gone back to Holland, she was no longer welcomed in the Cape Dutch community. Now say Kratoa, oh my koi son sleep and sleep, but grow in my now, but sing my now, psalm it kousa. Here on the kousa point, sing psalm it my, my eye Kratoa's minnelit, and in it, liefde, and in here, here on the kousa. We're here at the Castle of Good Hope, where on this day in 1674, Kratoa Iafa passed away on Robben Island and was buried here, right where this bench is. A few years later, her remains were exhumed and taken just up the road to the Ingeer Kerk, where she now rests. Controversially, Khoisan descendants feel that this bench is an inappropriate and insulting way, an undignified way in which to honor this mother of the nation. She should be revered. The statues should be not only on Robben Island, outside of the castle, all over. Kratoa's name should have been echoing within our communities. I'll now read to you the diary entry for the castle for exactly that day. The 29th of July, 1674. How changeable this African climate is. The west wind, which had by its violence caused a boisterous sea, and during the last two days had threatened everything with destruction, had today gone down completely, followed by such calm weather that not the slightest motion could be observed in the air, whilst the bay was as smooth and bright as a mirror. This day departed this life. A certain Hottentu named Irfa, long ago taken from the African brood in her tender childhood. Just about 70 kilometers north of Cape Town, we find this beautiful stretch of fertile land. It is known as the Swartland, and in the distance, we see the Riebeck Castile Mountain, named after the commander, Jan van Riebeck. When van Riebeck arrived in the Cape, this region stretching all the way to Saldana, and even further, was a home to a cattle-rich and powerful Khoikhoin tribe. They were the largest group, really, between the peninsula and between the little Namaka in the northwest. And they would have been a large and semi-nomadic group. According to accounts, they uh, had lots of cattle and they were constantly on the move. So they, they very seldom settled anywhere for more than two or three days. While the Dutch saw an opportunity to trade with a cattle-rich nation, they turned out to be their biggest obstacle to colonial expansion into the interior, and it would lead to a brutal and protracted conflict that lasted for many years. Now, the Kohukwa tribe existed in a sort of a horseshoe pattern around the peninsula. 
Okay, there are two leaders, or two known leaders, there were actually many more, but the two um, celebrated leaders are, of course, Udesowa, who had his kraal um, on the west coast, close to Saldana Bay, and there was Gonema, or Gonomoa, who had his kraal at Goedemans Kloof. Well, it landed up at Goedemans Kloof, but who had various kraals all along the, uh, well, all over the, the Boland region, the main one being at Klapmans. So, the Kohokwa being um, very much larger in number, than the Horinaikwa and the Horahokwa, prevented further expansion of the colony, essentially just by their presence. But Nkhonomoa was actually the, the deputy chief of the Kohokwa. The Kohokwa's headquarters at that time was near Saldana Bay, and the chief was Odusua. But in 1673, when Nkhonomoa started his war, against the VOC, Odiso was already an old guy and he was quite contented with what he had. He couldn't see the danger and the risks in the VOC's settlement at the Cape. He just couldn't see it because he was rich. He had thousands of cattle and sheep, etc. So he couldn't see the reason why he should fight. 18 July, 1673. The Dutch East India Company sends Hieronymus crews to attack the Kohokwa. This attack, executed on horseback, marks the beginning of the Second Dutch Khoi Khoi War. The Second Frontier War was more a war fought further away from the Cape Peninsula in the Berg River area of today. After the signing of the land transactions of 1672. Once the Kachokwa lost the war, they, they had to pay sort of an indemnity or, or fine, or they were basically stripped of a great deal of their livestock. The Dutch basically destroyed the economic independence of what had been this most powerful group. They start encouraging what they call trek boers, to move into new lands. And they create a legal instrument for them to do that called um, a grazing license. So they give these, the, these would-be farmers grazing licenses. They move into the koi lands. They, they take the koi's cattle and they seize the watering holes. And then the Dutch East India Company created another legal instrument called uh, a Leonang a Platz, uh, a loan farm. And the loan farm system is basically saying to white settlers, there's no impediment now on you taking land. There's no one going to stop you from taking land. So you can go and take land. The Koi Koi aren't going to resist you anymore. They're probably not there in the same numbers anymore. So you can take the land. And the only stipulation is that you pay an annual rental to the company. The principle that was applied for the most part was the terra nullius um, argument. That terra nullius just was not uh, a, a correct uh, legal doctrine. And for a fact, the uh, United Nations has denounced that terra nullius as uh, 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 not a legal doctrine that entitled people to come and take other people's land. By the turn of the, of the 18th century, already there were 400 farms in possession of of settler farmers. Some of these farms, um, 10, 20 of them even, owned by one person or in the name of one person. 